the Eila Hamishpotim. And these are the laws Ashatosim Lefneim, which you should place before them. So this the first Rashi, famous Rashi, the Pasuk could have said Eila Mishpotim. These are the laws. It says Ve'el and there's the connecting Vav, meaning the Vav connects what we're saying now to what was stated previously. The previous parsha, what did we discuss? We discussed Sinai. Ve'ela. This is a continuation of Sinai. So Rashi explains, Komok shenem ha'ela, posa l'esur yishonim. Whenever it would have said ela, this is this is what it's about. So that comes to negate what was stated before. Ve'ela most of the yishonim. Ve'ela is comes to it's a, a continuation. It's to add to what was said er, earlier previously. Ma yishonim be Sinai, just as the aseres adibros were definitely from Sinai, as it says. It was clear that at the absolute clear clarity level. Hashem spoke to Moshe, oh, he spoke to us. The laws which we speak about in this parasha are also Sinai laws, they're divine. Okay, so that's the value of the Ve'ela. You would think that these laws are laws that were promulgated by what? By the by the courts, rabbinic laws. No, Ve'ela Mishpotim, these laws, because certain laws are necessary for society. As we see, even if you have a slave, man sells himself, either because he stole or because he was pressed for money and he sold himself into slavery. Maximum, a Jew can only be sold for six years. The seventh year, he must go out free. No, this is a Torah, this is divine. As this, the Aseris and Dibras were divine, is the word of Hashem. The law is stated in this parsha, and what continues is the word of Hashem. The portion previously at the end of Yisrael concludes building the Mizbeach. That you build the Mizbeach, the stones cannot be cut with, with a metal implement, and so and the ramp should not have steps, it should be a ramp, so you should not have to lift your legs, which connotes certain things which are inappropriate, which is a disrespect. Lomaloch Shetosim Sanhedrin Eitzel Migdosh. That where did the Sanhedrin convene in the base of Migdosh? The Mishnah tells us that there was a chamber in the base of Midrash, which was called Lishka Sagosis. It was the Lishka, it was the chamber of cut stone. And that's where the Sanhedrin, this is the High Court of Israel, 71 judges would convene. And it was located literally adjacent to the sanctuary, to the Azorah. The Azorah is where, where the one was able to bring, where the Mizbeach was, where one was able to bring sacrifices. That's that was the location of the Sanhedrin. It was adjacent, literally abutted on the on the Azor and the sanctuary. So ju just as how do we know this? Because Torah juxtaposes El Mishpotim to the previous portion, which concludes with the Mizbeach. So we see the Sanhedrin should be adjacent to the Mizbeach. That's the juxtaposition of Mishpot El Mishpot in this parsha to the previous parsha. So firstly, let's talk about the first, the Ve'ela, the Vav. Just as the previous laws were Sinai, th this is Sinai. There's a famous word which I always mention, Pirkei Ovos, which are known as ethics, how a Jew has to behave, how he has to conduct themselves. In what Seder is it? Right? The, the Shas, the Talmud is divided into six sec sections. Shisha Sidorim. It's Located in Nizikin. Yeah. Nizikin is not the first, the opening section of Shas. You have Zroim, you have Moed, you have Noshim, Nizikin. You have Noshim, you have, you have laws which pertain to women, marriage, divorce, all those laws. And finally, you come to Nizikin. Pirkei Ovos is not even the beginning of the Zikim. Bava Kama, Bava Metziah, Bava Basra, these are the first tractates at the beginning of the Zikim. Later on, we have Pirkei Ovos. Who's the redactor of the Mishnah? Who authored the Mishnah? Rabbi Yudha Nosi. What is the introduction to Pirkei Ovos? 
Moshe Kimel Torah by Sinai, Umasari Yeshua, Yeshua Liz Kanim, Zakanim Lenavim. He gives us the transmission of Torah. It started with Moshe Sinai to Yeshua, Yeshua Liz Kanim. He's giving us the where it all began. Where do you think Review Danosi should make this introduction? In the fourth Seder? In the middle of the fourth Seder, or the introduction of Shas, which is Tershbal Peh, which is the oral law, it should start before we start Brochos, which is the law of Krishna, which is the Torah law. Moshe Kibbal Tabri Sirai. That's why we're obligated to say Krishna twice a day, as it says in the Mishnah. Evening, day Krishna, and all the other laws that follow. Why did Rabbi Yudha Nasi wait until? The Zikin to first give us the order of transmission that all began at Sinai. It's a question which is asked. The answer which is given is that there's no question. We all know that many things or most things were given at Sinai. They're all divine. But what about ethics and morals? How a human being has to behave. And most Jews who study Pirkei Ovos, read the words of the Tanoim, they say, the Tanoim, they were so insightful and their concepts are so profound. The level of genius that lies in the words of Pirkei Ovos, you know, they were sociologists. They were psychologists. They understood exactly how to build a society. Tefillin is not a consideration. Shabbos is not a consideration that we attribute it to themselves. But ethics and morals, how a person has to behave, this maybe was what was created and established due to their understanding of humankind, how to, a person has to maintain himself as a human being, as a Jew. A Jew maybe has to even, has to be more sensitive to many things. Rabbi he says, don't make that mistake. Kriya is not a question, it's divine. It began, began at Sinai. Shabbos began at Sinai. Yom Tov began at Sinai. All these other tractics, or oh, that's all Sinai without a question. But ethics and morals, I would think maybe that has to do with, that's, that's Chazal. It all began with them. On that review, Danos, he says, and says, just as all laws of Torah are mutable, it's not subject to change because it's divine. Identically, the Ovos, what, the, what we find, Pirkei Ovos, Moshe Kibbal Tobin Sinai, Mesorah Yeshua. It's the identical transmission from the source. And therefore, these things that we find in Pirkei Ovos are immutable. And therefore, it's, it's, it's part of our eternity. Identically, I would think. To create a to establish a society, you have certain laws. In Jewish, in 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 Judaism, there's no such thing as a penal system. A prison system doesn't exist. Person steals, and he's not able to re to compensate the one he victimizes. He sold the slavery for that amount of money. The maximum six years. The Torah sets all the parameters of what it is and how you pay back whether it's the item, whether it's the value of the item, all these various laws. These are Sinai laws. Therefore, here where you may attribute it to Chazal, because they create what a society is. I'll give you an example. There's a law that one of the Shevmits of Noach is Mishpatim, that they have to establish a judicial system. What does that mean? I mean, there are laws which are very specific. You're not permitted to steal, you're not permitted to kill, you're not permitted to commit adultery, incense, incest, but so what is the what is the best thing? What is the courts besides adjudicating? Their responsibility is to promulgate and legislate laws to maintain their communities. And whatever the court decides, if they're violated, it's punished by death. That's the law of courts. The courts have that right to promulgate and legislate laws which become. As they, if they want it to remain in effect, that becomes the law, and no one, and that per, person violates that, it has the liability of death penalty. That's mishpati. So they create their own societal laws. It's not given by the Torah. They're given, they're given the ability, the power to create these laws. With us, we have rabbinic laws, which are only fences. We're not permitted to enter the Torah. We are only permitted to legislate laws to protect the Torah. But all the nuances, the details of the, of the essence of Torah, which are endless subcategories, 
of the Targ Mitzvos, they, these are all divine. Therefore, we have to say, these are the laws. What's the difference between a mishpat, a chok, and edus? Mishpat is what? Is a rational law. Stealing. Ownership laws. These are called mishpatim. These are laws. The others are statutes, or we keep them because the testaments and something of the past. Mishpat says it's logical. We, it, make, it makes sense. As much as it makes sense and we relate to it, but the base word is not because they're rational, but rather the Elam Mishpatim, because just as the Aser Sadibris were from Sinai, these rational laws are all Sinai laws, and therefore we're bound to them, and we cannot at all compromise whatever they may be. Rab Gifter, he was tells her Shiva in Cleveland, and he was born in Virginia. And he spent a lot of time in Baltimore. He had family. And then before World War II, he went to study in Europe in Tels. And he became, he married the daughter of the Tels Roshiv from Europe, who perished in the Holocaust. And he became eventually became the Roshiva of Tels in Cleveland. So he used to come to Baltimore very well. And he spoke. So he once asked a question, which they asked in Tels in Europe. We find that the Aseris Adibros, the, the Tenth Command, the Jews heard themselves directly from Hashem. Whether it was all well, ten, and but they only heard actually two directly. But they, but if you take a look at the Aseris Adibros, they're all rational laws. Every one of them, the provision to kill, to steal, to kidnap, honoring a parent. No one shouldn't have designs on one's fellow's property. All these laws, the Shabbos to commemorate creation, and so on and so forth. And we read last week's reading when originally when Moshe came to tell the Jews that God wants to give him his Torah, says Naser Nishma. They said Nishma. We're going to listen. Meaning, so Rashi cites Chazal. We want to hear it directly from Hashem. We don't want to hear it through an intermediary initially. But when they heard it, they said to Moshe, it's too much. The intensity of that communication is too much. You should be the intermediary between us and Hashem. And so Moshe says, you don't understand. This experience is It's to uplift you and that that the fear of God should be on your face. This experience will be etched in your Emotion, your minds, and your shamas forever. So the laws of their service of Dibros, that experience for all generations makes it part of eternity. So he asks, the Aseris of Dibros are all rational laws. A rational law, you say, you know, that makes sense. But something like Paraduma, which even Shlomo Mel says, Rechokimi many. It's beyond him. He couldn't grasp it. Other statutes he was able to understand. Aseris of Dibras should have been statutes. Dietary laws. But the ra- rational laws, which are rational laws, such as the Aseris of Dibros, why did they have to be the ones that were directly, we heard from the mouth of Hashem, that it should make that indelible impression on us, things which we understand, and not things which are statutes which we don't understand. They should have been communicated openly and that would have made that impression on us, regardless, although we have no understanding of them, we embrace them, we accept it. That was the question he would ask. So he would say, explain, this is what they would answer, that a statute, we can't even begin entering the rationale of that a statute. We accept it. What do we accept? It's the word of Hashem. But let's say you say, you're not permitted to steal, to steal. Now we have a what is stealing? What about a man mistakenly, which we discussed today in Bavitzia, he lends me money, and the question is a certain amount, and I count the money he gives me, and there's more than actually I we, he wanted to lend me. Do I have a right to keep that additional money? That's not part of the debt he gave it to me as a gift to lender. Well, no, it was a mistake. And therefore, I have to give him back the money, which was additional to the loan. Or let's say a person overcharges a person. These are rational laws. That all that those are all subcategories of stealing. You're not permitted to take that. 
something that we have an understanding of what is, what's not, those are the areas that we rationalize and we justify. And because of our conflicts, we allow ourselves that we set the parameters of whatever those laws are. A statute that we can't even begin understanding, I'll give you an example. The Rabbam rules based on the Gemara in Sanhedrin that if a person aborts an unborn fetus, one is invited after 40 days of conception, one is 40 days of conception after that's called life, one is in violation of Lotirzoch. That's called taking a life. One has, doesn't have liability, a death penalty, because until the child is born into existence, which the Gemara said discussed what's considered being born. When the head, the top of the head comes out of the mother, that the child is considered born, then you've killed the human being to have the liability death penalty. But in terms of the negative commandment of the Tirzoch, taking the life, you violate it. So you'd say, why? Life is after the child is fully born. Before the child comes out, it's not it's the beginning. It's, it will be life. It's potential, but it's not life. What about a mercy killing? where the suffering of the person is beyond one's understanding of level of suffering, do you have a right to end that person's life? Because in our minds, why, why, why are you not permitted to kill? Because it's cruelty. But over here, which is the ultimate act of compassion, maybe if that's the case, we have a right to pull the plug. You have a right to end the person's life before he would have ended, he would have died naturally. Taurus is low tzach. God sets those parameters. Regards of what you believe and think and want to justify and frame it differently, you cannot be framed differently. Lotirzach is Lotirzach. Stealing is stealing. And every one of these laws are as Hashem said it. Although we, we relate to why they're wrong, we can't put our own spin on them. That's the reason why it had to be received and heard openly and directly from Hashem for that reason. But statutes that we have no relevance even to begin entering into the rationale of why they exist, it's not necessary. We accept it. The Eila Mishpatim. Mishpatim means these are rational laws. Person steals, he sold the slavery. Do you ever how long do you have a right to keep him? How do you have to treat him when he is your slave? Is he your chattel? Is he like your animal? All these various laws. Or even the laws when we have the Evid Kanani, a Canaanite slave, which he is your chattel. There he he's your possession forever unless you emancipate him. Are you permitted to abuse him? And if you should kill him, what is the liability? Is it like you killed an animal? Say it's a human being. But even that set, there's certain parameters set. Therefore, this is divine. This is not legislated by the Chachomim because these are rational laws. That's the Be'ela, just as the previous Parsha, our Sersa Dibros, was Bisinai. These rational laws, which are necessary to maintain a society, these are all also Sinai laws, although it's not explicit in the Torah, only the connecting above, which tells us that they're sourced in Sinai. Where does the, I guess, transition from what Hashem's edicts are to what human beings are able to work within the parameters that Hashem has said. Okay. Now, there's a negative commandment. You're not permitted to add to the Torah. You're not permitted to subtract from the Torah. So what's the basis for rabbinic fences? And we mentioned last week in the, in the, in the Yisro, I didn't mention this, Nora Chaim she explains that the Kofam Harkigigis, although we said Nasev Nishma, God put the mountain over our heads because they weren't agreeable to accept rabbinic fences, that the rabbis were empowered by the Torah to legislate fences because they said there's no end to it. It's their evaluation of society and they keep, they'll literally lock us in a box. Therefore, that's something we, we don't want to accept. It's your word is one thing, but giving it to humankind that the rabbi should be authorized and empowered to legislate laws as fences there's no, there's no end to it. Hashem says, without fences, the Torah will not survive. Because of the frailties of, you, of the human beings and the vulnerabilities to various things, you have to have fences. And without fences, therefore, the fences are as important as the Torah law. That was the call from the Herkigigis. So the only reason why fence is not considered adding to the Torah 
is because it's to secure what you have. But even the Chazal, whenever they make a, made a fence, for instance, I'll give you an example. The Gemara we study in Avodah Zorah, the law is rabbinically, if a non-Jew touches the wine of a Jew, and the wine is not pasteurized. The Allah is you're not permitted to drink the wine, rabbinically. Why? Because it has to do because only it has to do with libations, and has to do because the social drink, the social be beverage is wine, and ultimately it could lead to assimilation. That if you go and socialize with the non-Jew, ultimately you're going to end up marrying his daughter. So it's a fence for assimilation and for other things. They originally had said that any olive oil, olive oil was like a staple, and olive oil was the quality oil, the extract of an olive, and they said olive oil that's produced a touch by a non-Jew, you're not permitted to drink from it. And you're not permitted, it's off limits. But it turned out it was something too difficult for the people to accept. So it was called it was a decree, it was an edict, which the Tzibor was too much for them to accept. So there's an argument in the Rishonim whether they retracted it because it was too difficult, only because of retraction, it's no longer a place. So no, anything which is based on a misevaluation, automatically, it's only legislated if the people have the capacity to accept it. If it turns out they don't, then, then it doesn't stand. It has no standing. It has no halachic value, and they're not bound. So original was based on an evaluation. They misevaluated. And because of that, therefore, that rabbinic fence no longer exists. So we had said, there's that law that if Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos, you're not permitted to blow the shofar rabbinically. Why? So Rabbi says, because there's a zero, a concern, Shemi Avriyan Dalar Shusarabin. You may train if a person does not have to blow the shofar because of the sense of responsibility, obligation, and the value of that mitzvah, you may take that shofar without really thinking, transport it four cubits in public domain which is a Torah violation. If Chazal said, since there's a chance it may lead, bring to Shabbos desecration, we suspend the mitzvah of, sh of shofar on Shabbos, and they're empowered to do this. And how do we know? Where do we know there's such a concern? Because the two psukim, we find Rosh Hashanah, the Torah is referred to as Yom Trua, the day of the blast, and we find the day of Rosh Hashanah is referred to as Zichron Trua, the remembrance of the blast. So the Gemara asks, is it, do we actually, it seems to be you don't actually blow the shofar. It's only, you, you say psukim, which refer, which mention the shofar, but to actually blow, you don't. So how do we reconcile the two? So the Gemara answers, it's speaking, zichron trua is Rosh Hashanah falls out on Shabbos. One does not blow the shofar, because there's a concern you may transport the show public domain, but it's only rabbinical. But the Torah says zichron, it's a puzzle. So the Ritva says, we mentioned Amen Ritva, there are the times where the Torah says there's certain red flags and it's up to Chazal to make an evaluation of that particular time in history, whether there's a concern they may violate or not. And whenever they feel, based on their evaluation, that people are vulnerable to cross those lines, then they legislate. But that legislation is rabbinical legislation. The Torah is only alerting us that there's certain areas that there should be a concern, you should be on the lookout that you should secure those areas. But when you secure them, that's the, to protect the Torah, and therefore it's only rabbinical. That, that, that's where that was mentioned. But, but no, Torah Shemal Peb, the oral law, we're only transmitting the law that was Hashem's interpretation of his Torah, of the written law that was given at Sinai, and all they're doing is showing how the oral law is, ex is extrapolated or extracted from the written law through the Yubim Lidos, the 13 methodologies through which the Torah is interpreted. That's Yudgim Lidos at Torah, the treasure spread. But what Mark is referring to is what I mentioned, the times where it's called Asmachta, where there are certain psukim that the posuk alludes to certain things. I'll give you an example. The famous Machlokas, the Rambam and the Ramban, Tfilo, is it a Doraisa or is Tfilo Drabonam? It says, You should serve God with all your heart. So the Mars says, What's considered service of the heart? So there's the Machlokas. That quote in the Gemara, is that a Torah quote? Or is that a rabbinic quote? 
Rabbam learns that it's a Torah quote. Ezu avod shebelev of love dem cholav avchem. That's the basis tefillah is a doraisa. Ramban says no, asmachto. It's only asmachto. It's the Torah is alerting us. You have no obligation if you pray. It is a, you fulfill it a Torah. It's valued at a Torah level, but you have no obligation. The obligation to pray three times a day it's all rabbinical. Rabbam agrees. The Torah obligation is once in twenty four hours. The Rabbinical obligation is three times a day. Mayriv, Arvish, Mincha, Shachris, and Mincha. But again, it's based on a words of the Torah. Is that what the Torah is actually saying in terms of obligation? Or it's alluding and like recommending it's up to Chazal if they want legislated or not. If a person inadvertently violates the Torah law, one eats not kosher inadvertently. What's the law? You have to do tshuva. You have to repent. If you violate a rabbinic law inadvertently, one does not do tshuva. So I, I quote in the past, it's the Nesib Samishvot. Why? So he goes to explain. When the Torah says you're not permitted to eat not kosher, you're not permitted to wear shotnings. Person wears shotnings inadvertently, didn't realize he wearing shotnings. The combination of wool and linen, linen in one garment, that garment innately compromises our spirituality because of the combination of wool and linen. So when you do it deliberately or inadvertently, it doesn't make a difference. If you do it deliberately, the two, the two problems, it's the actual what you violated, meaning you were engaged in something which is detrimental to spirituality. In addition, you went against the word of Hashem because you knowing that he said you're not permitted. How did you do it? So the two things. But even if it was done inadvertently, it doesn't change the reality. What you engaged in is something which is detrimental to spirituality. It's like a person doesn't realize and he takes poison. That unless you have something to neutralize it, it's going to compromise the person, maybe and take his life. Identically, the negative commandments, every one of them is actually the equivalent of something which will destroy or compromise our spirituality. So you do it deliberately, it does make a difference. A rabbinic law, what does the Torah say? Lo sosim kalashi Do not deviate from what their words, what they say. So the provision is to go against their word. What about, I wasn't aware they said that, it's not permitted. So there's nothing innate in the wrong of, of the idea. It's purely offense. Except Torah says you must listen to them. So if the reason why I didn't listen is not because I chose not to listen, but it's only because I wasn't aware you did nothing wrong. Therefore, there's no, there's no reason to chew for there. It's only when you're aware and you say it's not that important, it's not that serious, therefore it's not a Torah law, that's that's the Torah violation. Because Torah says it's not up to you to decide whether you should listen or not listen. Torah says you must listen. And what if you became aware after the fact? Doesn't make a difference. Now, once you become aware going forward, you have you, you, and now if you violate it, then then, then you violate then you you to, you're in violation of the Torah law because you didn't listen to them. But the provision is not listening. So whether it's waiting six hours or whatever amount of time you wait between dairy and, and meat, these are rabbinic laws. Or other muktzah, which is a rabbinic law. Even though if we call one muktza, whatever we call, we all call basa b'cholov, much laws which pertain, many laws which thanks to milk and meat, they're all rabbinic laws. So one wasn't aware of basa b'cholov, wasn't aware of muktza. Right? And he violates both. What do you do tshuva for? You do tshuva for, for lososur. I didn't listen to the chacham. That's the Torah violation. That's what you have to do tshuva for. It happens to be the application of the rabbinic laws, milk and meat, rabbinically, or mukta that certain things you're not permitted to engage in on Shabbos. Okay? Rashi cites the Chazal. Why does the Torah juxtapose Eilam Mishpatim to the portion of the Mizbeach? That just as to tell us that the Sanhedrin, the High Court of Israel, when they would convene, they would convene in a location which was... A, Adjacent to the Azorah. Literally, there was a line of demarcation, the Azorah, the sanctuary where you were able to bring a korban. And then you had this chamber where they would convene, which was called Lishkas Agozis. 
So when they convene, it has to be in that location. Okay. You know, there's an interesting law that we know that the only court that's able to issue verdicts of death penalty is only a court of 23 Dayanim. You have to a court comprised of 23 judges which have the ordination of Moshe Rabbeinu. The court Smuchim, Mumchim. The Sanhedrin Gedola has 71, 70 judges plus a judge who's the chief justice who presides over all the 70, 71. The law is, so a court is made of, comprised of three, even though if they're Mumchim, they have the ordination of Moshe Rabbeinu, they could issue verdicts of Malkos, penalty, monetary, all that. But death penalty, not. You need a best of 23. But what's the law? What happens if the Sanhedrin is not in session? The Sanhedrin Gedola in the Lishka Sagosis, which is adjacent to the Azora, the low courts cannot issue verdicts of death penalty. The only time they can issue those verdicts of death penalties only if the high court is in session. If they're in, if they're in session, they're in Lishkas Agosis, adjacent to the Azora, the sanctuary, then the lower courts can, otherwise they cannot. What, what is this all about? I mean, if, if they, if, when they issue a verdict, it's not they consult with the San Ejikadola. They don't. So why only if, if they're, they're, they're in session, then the lower courts can. If not, they can't. I mean, evidently, with the issue of verdicts, they're independent verdicts. Of course, they themselves are qualified as long as you have the right number. In terms of to determine majority versus minority, all those laws. Now, the Gemara tells us that in Sanhedrin and in Shabbos, that called Dayan Shadon Emes Labito Shel Torah, not that if a dying issues a verdict which is true on an absolute level, and it's literally truth, which is unquestioned truth, he becomes God's partner in creation. And if not, if he issues the verdict which is inappropriate, meaning being aware it's he's corrupt, God says, I will take this the soul of that judge. I will take his. I will take his life. If you steal, God doesn't say I will take your life. But a judge who presides and issues a corrupt verdict, Hashem says I will take your life. If you issue a truthful verdict, you're my partner in creation. But if, to the contrary, you issue a, a, a verdict which is corrupt, God says I will take your life. So the Lord says so. And on believing that maybe his verdict may not be sufficiently correct, he's he's putting his life in jeopardy. So the Gemara says, rose. The dying only does, of course, he has to be qualified, but if he feels based on his understanding it's correct, he has nothing to worry about. Nothing to worry about. However, not to be subject to any levels of conflict, a dying should see himself like a sword is between his legs, a double-edged sword, and if you move movement in either, in either direction, you, you cut in half. That's the seriousness of approach you have to approach when a judge sits and presides over a case as as a as a diet, as a judge. Why? The Lord says, but if you do issue the correct verdict and you meet all the criteria of what a legitimate, honest court is, it says, there's a person to tell him, Elohim needs to be scale. God convenes together with the court. Meaning, if the judges, the court meets the criteria, which is set by the Torah, so then a human being is subject to human error. There's such a thing as human error. But if you meet the criteria which Hashem sets, it's not possible human error. Because Elohim needs a Badas Kale. Elohim sits with the Adas Kale, convenes with the Besdin. So God puts in their minds 
when they issued a verdict, as long as they meet all the protocols of a court, their, their verdict is divine. Because Hashem gives them, gives them that clarity to be able to issue the verdict. What happens if you find the witnesses afterwards are conspiring witnesses? And the person who was put to death was not guilty for that crime. You put to, to death an innocent person. The person was guilty. He may not be guilty for this crime, but God wanted that his life should be taken. Therefore, the court, the, the verdict of death penalty is not really a faulty verdict. It's a correct verdict. It may not be for this, but since they met all the criteria of the court, they interrogated the witnesses. And based on their understanding, they were valid witnesses. It's a basis to issue that verdict. And this is Elohim Litzvah's scale. So therefore, me, the court has to merit a certain siyata deshmayo for God's intervention to give them that level of clarity. The only time the lower courts have that level of clarity, meaning if they're directly connected to the high court, which is the Sanhedrin Gedola. So when the Sanhedrin Gedola, the high court convenes in the Lishkas Agosis, then the lower courts, that they... They merit that divine intervention and they have that clarity. But if the high court does not, is not in session, low courts don't have that divine, that divine clarity when it comes to death penalty. As a result of that, they're dealing with within the human, the human evaluation. Within the human evaluation, you can't take a life. Therefore, it's only if the high court is in session, only that the lower courts of 23 are able to issue the verdict of the death penalty. Okay. I'll get into it more tomorrow. There's not enough time now to explain. The question is why it has to be juxtaposed to the Lishka to the Azora and why, what's the whole idea of Kimi Tzion Tesi Tzora? The whole idea of, from Zion, from, that's where Torah emanates from. We juxtapose, we finish the Shimon Esrei, we, we, the last supplicate, she bought a base of Migdash from the of Yemenu, the same Chalkeim Zora Secho. We're asking for rebuilding the base of Migdash. And God give us our portion in Torah. You see, there's a connection between the Beis Amigdosh and to merit a, a connection uh, to merit our portion of the Torah. Same idea. To be able to come upon the understanding, the truth of Torah, you have to be within the proximity of the source of the Shekhinah, which is the sanctuary, which is the Azorah.